I don't see my lesson. I thought I pulled it up. Oh, I know. I see it. Hold on, y'all. I don't know what okay, there it is. Okay, I got to look at my notes. Share screen. I don't know what I did. I don't see share audio. Do y'all see the screen? No. No, ma'am. Wait a Share. Uh, you have to do the share screen. A on, share screen at the bottom. Yes, on Zoom. I don't see no lesson. Share. Mm, mm, mm. Sure. Oh, there it is. Do y'all see that? Yes. Uh, you yeah. were sharing. Okay, you were but trying I need to. to I'm trying okay, to get close, to the. Just close done. Okay, now I need to share the audio. I didn't see that. I didn't click on that. Well, then you have to stop sharing. Yeah, you can do that first. I have to. You click the share at the bottom, not on Zoom, not on the PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Okay, I did. Oh, share sound. Gotcha. Whew. You think I know it by now? I'm sorry, guys. Okay. This is um you see the screen, right? Yes, mm -hmm. but make it okay. Um, okay, this is a, a a video on a cleaning hacks. Some you might know and some you might not, but I did find out some new ones on uh on this particular video. before you begin the video, um hit slideshow at the top. Slideshow. Okay, here we go. I have some amazing home hacks to share with you guys today, and there are a lot of them, so buckle up, let's do this. To make this a little easier, I have organized today's hacks into the following categories, and we are going to get started with cleaning. For the first two hacks, you're going to get a broomstick candle. I just get mine right from the Dollar Tree. You can attach basically any duster using a zip tie. You could even just like put a balled up sock at the end of these. Then you can use it to get up into any hard to reach areas up high, whether you have vaulted ceilings. You don't need to have like eight different extendable different dusters or whatever. Get a single broomstick handle and you can reach them all. And if it's a really high location, just zip tie two broomsticks together. For the second hack, using this same broomstick handle, I'm actually going to get one of the sort of thicker brooms. These are like the outdoor broom heads that you can get. And these are amazing for cleaning your shower, like specifically along the floor, because this way you don't have to bend all the way over to scrub the tile. You can just put your cleaner down. You could scrub using this broom head. The reason I like this broom head better than a standard broom head is it's much more stiff, so you're really gonna be able to clean into the tile and into the grout and you save your back at it. Because I'm gonna be honest, I'm not 19 anymore. I know that it looks like I am, but I'm not. This next hack is when you are done cleaning any of your like chrome finished faucets or even if you have like door poles or whatever, is to use a piece of wax paper on these. What's going to happen is there's actually going to be like a little bit of invisible residue from the wax paper that's going to transfer onto the chrome. And this is going to prevent fingerprints from building up on your faucets and your finishes. Another hack for cleaning your shower is to get yourself one of these dish wands 
wands and you're just going to fill it up with one of your favorite shower cleaners and then this works as the easiest way to just like wipe down your shower I literally keep one in the shower and when I'm in the shower I can just like quickly scrub down the wall scrub down the tile like getting into any of the little corners I love it because the cleaner just stays right inside of the wand honestly I like dish wands for cleaning showers way more than I like them for actually cleaning dishes and while we're in the shower if you have a shower that has glass doors one of my favorite tricks is to actually use rain -X on it rain -X is obviously for your car you use it on the glass to help the water beat up but this works great in showers too because it's going to help the water beat up so you're less likely to get water spots once the water dries now you can always squeegee your showers after use that's really the best practice but if you have maybe children or like guests or husbands or whatever that maybe aren't going to do this rain -X is a great way to help prevent those water stains a toilet cleaning hack that I love is when you go into the bathroom you're gonna clean the bathroom start by taking some toilet paper I like to spritz mine with a bunch of vinegar but you can use whatever your favorite like toilet cleaner is and just shove it up into the rim of the toilet bowl because this is where all that like yuck and smell and whatever accumulates and then just let it sit there while you are cleaning the rest of your bathroom come back do the toilet last this will sort of sit there and help to break up all the grime and all the junk and all the smell and because it's toilet paper then you can just flush it down when you are done a hack that I love for garbage cans if you have a garbage can where the trash bag keeps constantly falling back inside of it certainly you can tie it into a little knot but that's just extra work and who wants extra work just take two command hooks hang them upside down on the outsides of your garbage can and then you can use the handles of the garbage bag to clip onto these and this is going to prevent the garbage bag from falling inside of the trash bag every single time you go to put food in my favorite hack for cleaning a stainless steel sink is to just use a little bit of baking soda which is a micro exfoliant I sprinkle this all over the entire sink and just scrub down all the yuck and dirt and grime that has built up on your stainless steel sink. It's going to take your stainless steel sink from grimy and gross to shiny in literally just a couple of minutes. If you use wooden cutting boards, my favorite way to clean them is to sprinkle them with some coarse salt and then you're just going to use half of a lemon. You can even use like a lemon that you had juiced already and then you're going to just like scrub the coarse salt with the lemon. The lemon juice acts as like a natural cleaner but then obviously the coarse salt acts as sort of like an exfoliant and it's going to just disinfect and scrub down your cutting board leaving it nice and clean rinse it leave it out to dry and you've got a nice beautiful wooden cutting board I like to do this with wooden cutting boards like once a week if you've been placing dishes in your dishwasher all facing the same way you have been doing it wrong typically in dishwashers water tends to come up the center so you actually want your dishes to be facing all inward so that they get the most clean. If you have a knife that has developed some rust spots, there's a really easy solution for this. You're going to take a tall glass and mix it with equal parts of lemon juice and water and then you're going to soak this knife in it. I find that 10 to 20 minutes is usually a really good time and then you can basically buff away the rust spots using like the back of a sponge. If you have really rough rust spots on the knife, you can leave it soaking for a little bit longer but this will basically help to break away the rust and leave your knives shiny and clean. Here's a laundry hack for you keep a dry erase marker in your laundry room and this is why sometimes when we are washing things there are things that go into the washing machine that aren't supposed to go into the dryer and you can take the dry erase marker and write right onto your machine what needs to come out because this will remind you when you go to switch from the washer to the dryer remember to take that item out so it doesn't go in the dryer and get ruined speaking of the laundry did you know you can make your own dryer sheets I love this because it's obviously a lot more sustainable and it's going to save you a lot of money you're just going to take a Tupperware you're going to mix it with water and some fabric softener and then take some sponges you want the sponges that don't have any of like the scrubby back to them I get mine at the Dollar Tree cut these into half and then just let them soak in this water mixture when you are ready to put clothes into the dryer grab one of these sponges throw it in run your dryer as normal and then when you're done take that sponge back out put it back into the solution and you can continue to use these dryer sheets over and over and over again if you're somebody who hangs your clothes you might sort of avoid it because it feels like it takes forever I found the easiest way to fold my clothes is not to do it one by one but instead to lay all of my clothes flat that need to be hung and then you grab all of your hangers and you basically put the hanger on one and then just fold the top over and then you can put the hanger on the next one and fold the next one over and put the hanger on the next one and fold the next one over this seems like such a simple little concept but it's actually so much faster than hanging your items one by one you can now just pick up the entire load and put it right into the closet if you get water stains on your glassware a coffee filter can actually be one of the best ways to buff these away they obviously 
obviously on like paper towels they're not going to leave like any dust particles or whatever I feel like especially wine glasses always get water stains on them if you have a sock laying around which I'm sure you do because at some point you've had a sock that has lost its match where did its match go we don't know take this lone sock and you're going to take a little bit of rice mix it with an essential oil and fill up your sock and then just tie it closed and this creates a really great DIY air freshener you can keep these in dressers and closets and gym bags and diaper bags and backpacks my last two cleaning hacks is that toothbrushes are the ultimate cleaning tool that we never talk about I love toothbrushes for cleaning grout they're just the perfect little size one of my favorite mixtures is to use some baking soda some hydrogen peroxide with a little bit of dish soap to clean inside of the grout for any tile that you have that is like hard to get at toothbrushes are also the best tool to clean the cracks and crevices of toilets honestly I'm not gonna lie it's 2023 and I don't understand how we haven't invented a toilet that doesn't have so many cracks and crevices like we all know the toilet's getting gross. Why are you creating so many little spots where the grossness can accumulate? I'm not sure. But a toothbrush is one of the best tools to get into those little cracks and crevices for your toilet. So make sure you keep some spare toothbrushes in the bathroom. Just, you know, keep them somewhere different so you're not mixing them up with your regular toothbrushes. All right, let's move along to some food hacks. Now, I have been on a mission for like the last 15 years of my life, which is a little bit of an exaggeration, but probably for the last decade, to find the best way to do hard boiled eggs. I actually have an entire video where I was doing like Easter hacks and I tried like four different ways for making a hard-boiled egg and then peeling the hard-boiled egg that would be easier and all of them were fails. I've tried pretty much every hack that exists and don't tell me you have some hack that works because I tried it and whatever reason it didn't work for me until I finally found this hack and that is to air fry your eggs. Put your air fryer on the bake setting or just whatever setting lets you go down to 250 degrees. Once it's preheated put your eggs in for about 15 minutes and then you're going to put them directly into an ice bath. Stick them in the fridge and when you are ready to peel them they will peel off so easily next hack did you know if you roll your orange before you peel it it's going to make it a lot easier for the peel to come off you're never gonna peel an orange without rolling it again now I am 35 years old and I am still somebody that when I open a bread bag I will lose the little bread tag where does the bread tag go I don't know I like to think the bread tags and all of our lost socks are somewhere together they've created a community and they're living happily just like harvesting off the land they have a little commune and every Friday they get together and they play their acoustic guitars around a campfire but that doesn't really help me when I'm trying to close my bread but luckily you can actually close bread bags really easily without the bread tag you're just gonna go ahead and twist it a few times to get it closed and then you're going to take the excess that's over the top and fold it down back over the bread loaf now you've got a bread bag that is staying closed without the bread tag this next hack is for cutting more bite-sized watermelon especially great for little fingers you're going to start by cutting the watermelon in half and then you're going to place the watermelon cut side down onto your cutting board you're then going to basically just cut this into a grid I'm gonna be honest the first few times I did this I always like thought it would fall apart as I was cutting it but it doesn't and then you can just pull out the perfect little bite-sized pieces of watermelon I find these are much easier to cut and to eat than the triangles are again especially for small children okay this next hack is so cool you can actually cook corn inside of a cooler why do you need to cook corn inside of a cooler this is maybe if you're having a really big barbecue and you want to cook like a ton of corn at once maybe you're doing like 10 or more in this example where I'm showing you I'm not cooking 20 years of corn because I don't have enough people to feed 20 ears of corn too and I didn't want to be wasteful but I put a couple of ears of corn inside of a cooler and then you're just going to add boiling water to this let it sit for about 8 to 10 minutes and you're gonna have perfectly cooked corn that you can do in bulk if you have a pantry item that you are constantly measuring with a like measuring spoon consider putting just a piece of masking tape across the opening of this pantry item and that works as the perfect little level every time you are measuring you can get the perfect measure every single time this next hack is how to vacuum seal in a plastic baggy by removing most of the air from your food in your bag it'll last a lot longer in the fridge or freezer so you can simply submerge the bag into water then seal the top closed the water will push out all the excess air leaving your bag vacuum sealed okay when I learned how to properly cut a mango it changed my life because I love mango my kids love mango I hate cutting mango and then I finally one day was like why don't I peel this mango with a vegetable peeler first which is what I did you can peel the mango take off all the skin then you can just go ahead and cut around the core of the mango and get as much fruit as you need from it literally the only way that I do mangoes now my final food related hack is using a milk frother I love my milk frother but I actually use it for more than just frothy milk I also use it for making dressings specifically I like to make a lot of sauces in my own salad dressings and I don't want to have to whip out like my whole handheld mixer the milk frother is the perfect little like grab-and-go item and it works great for emulsifying your salad dressings or mixing together any little sauces that you're making for dinner all right we're moving along to storage and organization hacks first up I 
love using command hooks on my pantry storage bins to hang any scoops or teaspoons or whatever, like whatever item I'm using to scoop these out with. That way they're just always right where you need them. Also really great for kids if it's something that you're getting them to serve for themselves, whether like you're having them get their own snacks or their own cereals. This seems like kind of a duh hack, but I added command hooks to the side of my oven when we used to have the oven in a place where the side was exposed. And then I could just hang my pot hangers right here. Again, this seems like super obvious. I also love using command hooks to hang baskets. So I love doing this inside of cupboard uh, doors to make more use of unused space. I've talked about this hack a ton of times because I literally use it all of the time. So good in rental properties and small places where you don't have a lot of room for storage. You can also use it for bigger baskets as well, hang it onto the side of a vanity or onto a wall or whatever and easily create some extra storage space where you didn't have any. My next hack is clear museum gel. If you haven't used this stuff before, it is seriously life-changing for so many different things. I love using it inside of drawers to keep any of the bins I have inside from like moving around and shifting. If you don't know, museum gel is basically just this like clear gel that will help sort of adhere to items together, but then it is 100% removable. A kitchen storage hack that I always like to mention, this isn't maybe necessarily a hack, but it's just something to consider. Typically we think of keeping all of our kitchen stuff in the kitchen, but if you're somebody who lives in a small kitchen, I've had so many small kitchens in my life, it might not always make sense to store all of your kitchen appliances in the kitchen, especially appliances you're not using that often. So really just think about your most used kitchen appliances to keep in the kitchen and any of those appliances that you're not using monthly or maybe even weekly, see if there's somewhere else that you can store them. You know, if you have a pan that you're pulling out just for the holidays, keep that thing in the basement. Okay, final storage hack is for all of your plastic bags that you accumulate in the kitchen. I've seen hacks where people put them inside of old Kleenex boxes, but that only allows you to like hold a couple of plastic bags. So instead just save some random shipping box that you got from Amazon or whatever. If you want to get really fancy, you can cover it in like craft paper so it looks nice, but you're basically going to cut a hole out of the top of this and then you're going to put your plastic bags in here. And as you put them in, you're just going to feed the end of one bag through the handles of the bag before it. So this way, as you pull your bags out, it's going to pull the next bag up so it's available for you, kind of like Kleenex. Okay, moving along to just some basic home hacks. We started this video out with using a broomstick. Another way to use a broomstick is for outside. You can actually get two just like over the door hangers. I get these ones just from the Dollar Tree and hang these over like any fence or gate that you have in your backyard and then put the broomstick on this. And it works as a great place to hang out towels or just like to dry your kids' swimsuits or whatever. We don't have a pool or anything, but my kids do a lot of water play outside in the summer. And this just acts as a really quick and cheap way to have a place to dry this stuff. If you have wood floors, you probably had to deal with the little like felt covers that go on the bottom of your chairs and your table so that it's not scuffing up the wood, which means you probably have dealt with the frustration of them constantly falling off. I have found a better solution. You get these chair leg covers. They're basically like the felt piece built into like a rubber piece. And so the rubber just slides over the chair leg so that it stays on and it's not constantly falling off. Make sure that you're checking the size of these. They come in different sizes depending on like the width of the leg that you are trying to cover. If you have a rug in your home that's constantly curling on the corners, you can buy rug corners. These are basically just like sticky pieces that stick onto the rug and then will stick then onto the floor to keep the rug from curling up. But then when you need it to, it comes up off the floor without any issues. Okay, did you know that you can buy rechargeable light bulbs? Because I didn't know. And when I found out, I thought that it was pretty life-changing. You can buy these light bulbs that are literally rechargeable, which means you don't have to have it plugged in to the wall. So this is great if you have a lamp that's somewhere that you want like for decorative use, but it doesn't have an outlet available or maybe you're hanging up a light, a wall sconce, and you don't want to have to drill into the wall and you don't want the wire hanging down. These light bulbs are completely rechargeable, which means you can use them with no electrical source. Also a really great hack to have if you lose power, you'll always know that you have a couple light bulbs that still work. Speaking of tricky places to plug things in, I love these ultra thin socket covers. These are basically really thin covers that will go over a wall socket, but then it has a wire that comes down and out so you can then continue to plug stuff into this outlet. I love this for a couple of reasons. One, it's just a better look if you have an outlet that's like sitting out somewhere really obvious and seeing all of the things plugged in just looks kind of ugly, but it's also really great if you have a place where furniture is right up against the wall and so the things that are plugged into that outlet kind of stick out and push into the furniture or you can't push the furniture all the way up to the wall, these outlet covers are perfect. We actually have one in our appliance garage in our kitchen so that we can fit our coffee machine in there because we wouldn't be able to fit the coffee machine if the outlet was sticking all the way out. I wouldn't be able to close the door. So we used one of these thin covers to fix that. Okay, next up you can buy these universal caster wheels. These essentially just like are adhesive and then you 
you can stick them onto the bottom of any appliance that you can easily slide the appliance around. This is great for any appliances you keep underneath your kitchen counters and you want to be able to pull them out and use them and then slide them back in really easily. It also works really great on the bottom of storage bins if you have storage bins in a place that you want to be able to easily pull out and access and then slide back in. I just think these are really smart product to make something basically easier to slide in and out of something. If you've ever seen those flower arrangements that have these like big beautiful flower arrangements in a low bowl or a long skinny bowl and you kind of wondered how they did it, this is how. You're going to take some tape, masking tape or just scotch tape or whatever and create a grid over the receptacle that you want to put flowers in and then you can essentially use each one of these as like a mini vase to fill the entire thing with flowers. This works on all sorts of different bowls and vase sizes to make it something you can put flowers in that maybe you wouldn't have been able to before. If you have a door in your house that is kind of drafty, you can actually make a DIY door draft stopper for literally like no dollars with just like items you have in your house. You're going to get two of the inside rolls from gift wrap or like craft paper if your kids use craft paper and then you're going to get a pantyhose. You're going to cut one of the legs off and then you're just going to slide the two roll tubes into the pantyhose and then you can slide this onto the bottom of your door. Obviously with one roll being on one side of the door, one roll being on the other side of the door. Now you've created a really easy draft stopper and you don't have to spend any money on it. If you ever need to hang something in a pinch and you're lazy like me and you don't want to get out like a measuring tape and a level and mess with all of that, just get yourself a piece of painter's tape or masking tape. You're going to take this and you're going to put it on the back of your frame and you're going to mark out any of the places that there are like the little hangers and then you can take this piece of tape and hang it up on your wall and you will know exactly where to drill your holes or to like nail in your nails for hanging this item. It also works really great for hanging a couple of things because you can sort of visualize where each one is going to go before you do it. Okay if you want some at home s'mores but you don't have a fire pit or a place to make s'mores you can make your own DIY s'mores roasting kit. This is so fun. It would be super cute for like a party or whatever. Basically you just need a terracotta pot. Fill it up with some aluminum foil and then just take a couple of the charcoal bits that you use you know like for your for a charcoal grill. And you're gonna light these on fire. Let them burn off for like 10 or 12 minutes and you're just going to be left with super hot coals and you can actually toast marshmallows on this. I tested this one time and I was able to toast marshmallow after marshmallow after marshmallow for making s'mores without having an entire fire. My last little basic home hack is for hot glue guns. If you ever use a hot glue gun you know that when you go to stick the next hot glue stick inside of the hot glue gun and you're like pressing it it's always like you're having to like push it down a few times before it finally grabs onto the piece that grabs it. Before you stick that hot glue stick into the gun just take the end of it touch it to the nozzle of the hot glue gun so that it softens and gets hot and then you stick it in and this way it will attach to the hot glue stick that is already in the gun and you won't have to keep pushing it down in there because it's just already attached and it's gonna make hot glue in a lot easier. All right my friends that does it for some of my best home hacks that hopefully will make your life a lot easier. Thanks for sticking with me for this entire video. I hope that you enjoyed it and as always I hope you're having a fantastic day. Remember to be kind to yourself and others and I will see you all in my next video. Okay, guys, how about that? Did, did you learn something new? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was neat. Some, yeah. some of the stuff I knew and uh, mm -hmm. some of them were some new things that yeah. I thought was really, really good. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and go with our lesson. Okay, my lesson is Jesus our Sabbath rest. The key to understanding how Jesus is our Sabbath rest is the Hebrew, Hebrew word Sabbath. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right. Sabbath, say, Sabbat, Sabbat, huh? Sabbat. Sabbat, okay, thank you. Which means to rest, or to stop or cease from work. The origin of the Sabbath goes back to creation. After creating the heavens and the earth in six days, God rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made, and that's in Genesis 2, 2. This doesn't mean that God was tired and needed a rest. We know that God is omnipotent, literally all powerful. He has all the power in the universe. He never tires, and his most arduous 
expenditure of energy does not diminish his power one bit. So what does it mean that God rested on the seventh day? Simply that he stopped what he was doing. He ceased from his labors. This is important in understanding the establishment. Wait a minute. I'm going to have to move this. The establishment of the Sabbath day and the role of Christ as our Sabbath rest. Um, before I go to the next um, page, Sharina, could you get um, Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11? Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. And when I come to it, I'd, I'd like for you to read that for us. God used the example of his resting on the seventh day of creation to establish the principle of the Sabbath day rest for his people. In Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Do you have it, Sharina? And there's two scriptures, uh, Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15, but they both say the same thing. So I'm just going to have her read that um, one, okay. if you can go ahead and read it. Okay, um, Exodus 20, 8 through 11 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your, all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Okay, thank you. So God gave the Israelites the fourth of his Ten Commandments. They were to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. One day out of every seven, they were to rest from their labors and give the same day of rest to their servants and animals. This was not just a physical rest, but a cessation of laboring. And cessation means to stop uh, laboring. So whatever work they were engaged in was to stop for a full day each week. The Sabbath day was established so the people would rest from their labors only to begin again after a one day rest. The various elements of the Sabbath symbolize the coming of the Messiah who would provide a permanent rest for his people. Once again, the example of resting from our labors comes into play. With the establishment of the Old Testament law, the Jews were constantly laboring to make themselves acceptable to God. Their labors include trying to obey a myriad of do's and don'ts of the ceremonial law, the temple law, the civil law and etc. Hmm. Of I'll just leave it up. Of course right. they could possibly keep all of course they couldn't possibly keep all those laws. So God provided an array of sin offerings and sacrifices so they could come to him for forgiveness and restore fellowship with him but only temporarily. Just as they began their physical labors after a one day rest, so too did they have to continue to offer sacrifices. 
uh, Hebrews 10, 1 tells us that the law can never buy, can never buy the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. But these sacrifices were offered in anticipation of the ultimate sacrifice of Christ on the cross, who after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God in Hebrews 10, 12. Just as he rested after performing the ultimate sacrifice, he sat down and rested, ceased from his labor of atonement, because there was nothing more to be done ever. Because of what he did, we no longer have to labor in law keeping in order to be justified in the sight of God. Jesus was sent so that we might rest in God in what he had provided. Okay, in the Old Testament, um, I know we've... Um, Pastor Ivan has taught us about the sacrifices that they did uh, for, they had uh, certain animals that they had to sacrifice for this, uh, according to the sin, whatever sin they did. And this was constantly, they, that's what it says, this, it was a constant thing. It was only temporary when they uh, asked for forgiveness by using these sacrifices to, um, um, take the place of the sin that they had to get. But here it's it's telling us Jesus made that one sacrifice for us and we don't have to um, do those sacrifices that, that they did back in the Old Testament. He was the one, he did the one sacrifice. And when he sacrificed his life for us, that's the was the ultimate sacrifice and all we had to do all we have to do is to receive him as our personal lord and savior and then we can rest rest he was sent like it says jesus was sent so that we might rest in god and in what he has provided so we don't have to worry about that but we do have to ask for forgiveness but we don't have to do the things that uh, people did in the old testament and i think I, I'll, I'll explain that too another element of the sabbath day rest which god instituted as a foreshadowing of our complete rest in christ is that he blessed it he sanctified it and he made it holy here again we see the symbol of Christ as our Sabbath rest, the holy, perfect son of God who sanctifies and makes holy all who believe in him. God sanctified Christ just as he sanctified the Sabbath day and sent him into the world, John 10, 36, and I think uh, two to be our, yeah, this is the, the scripture, to be our sacrifice for sin. In him, we find complete rest from the labors of our self-effort because he alone is holy and righteous. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. And uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, we can now cease from our spiritual labors and rest in him, not just one day a week, but always. So um, Christ made that sacrifice for us and we don't have to uh, uh, use uh, animals and uh, the things that they had to sacrifice back in the Old Testament. God, uh, Jesus is our final, was our final sacrifice. And it's all, as long as we uh, receive him and obey God, then um, we're, it's always, we're, we, we can rest in him. Any questions or comments?
I'm sorry, I didn't ask. I hate it. It's the Sabbath day on Sundays. Well, it's I had I I, I looked that up. No, well, it's any day that you now with the, the new in we're in the new covenant. Back then, they celebrated from sundown Saturday. Um, was it Saturday or Friday? Friday. Help. Okay, Friday. help me. That's see mine. I got, okay, from Friday to Saturday. We, um, in the in the new covenant that we're in, what, what I read is that whatever day you make um, the Sabbath day, Oh, okay. Just make sure that you, um, you know, use it to worship God. Because some people work on right. on um, on Sunday. You know, if they have another day that they okay. use for their Sabbath, you see what I'm saying? I see what you're saying. It, it's not it's not a rule right. like it was back in in the Old Testament. Okay. They they were made. That was one of that was one of their rules. I guess you want to say. Okay. But uh, am I saying it right, Pastor Yvonne? <laughs> uh, yeah. Any day. Basically. As long as you take one day out of right. the week. Yeah. To as celebrate. The, yeah. As far as the church is concerned, when you look at it from um, the church standpoint, the, the Jews still use the old uh, system, the old uh, Sabbath, which is from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. So right now the Jewish people are celebrating the Sabbath. Uh, oh. When it comes to the New Testament church, uh, the church has adopted the, the laws of the land, which, which says that our first day is on, uh, on Sunday. And that's, okay. also, that's also found in Corinthians, you know, from okay. the first day of the week. Uh, to come together so uh, for worship and so the church has adopted since our first day in general is Sunday the day of Sunday but okay. the word, yeah like Sister Joyce was saying the word Sabbath means to rest so if you work on Sunday a lot of people work on Sunday now and your yes. day off is Wednesday then take that yeah, day Sabbath. Right. But you oh, okay. have one day that you dedicate to the yeah. Lord. It's not just taking a day off, but right. you're supposed to spend it praying and fasting and worshiping. Right. God. Okay. Yes, because he'll accept that. God okay. will accept that. Okay, Jesus can be our Sabbath rest in part because he is Lord of the Sabbath. Matthew 12, 8. Is God incarnate? He decides the true meaning of the Sabbath because he created it and he is our Sabbath rest in the flesh. When the Pharisees criticized him, criticized him for healing on the Sabbath, Jesus reminded them that even they, sinful as they were, would not hesitate to pull a sheep out of a pit on the Sabbath because he came to seek and save his sheep who would hear his voice, John 10, 3 and John 10, 27. And enter into the Sabbath rest, rest he provided by paying for their sins. He could break the Sabbath rules. Since he made them, he can break them. He told the Pharisees that people are more important than sheep and the salvation he provided was more important than rules by saying the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And that's in Mark 2, 27. Jesus was restating the principle that the Sabbath rest was instituted to relieve man of his labors, just as he came to relieve us of our attempting to achieve salvation by our works. We no longer rest for only one day, but forever cease our laboring to attain God's favor. Jesus is our rest from works now, just as he is the door to heaven. 
where he, we will rest in him forever. Uh, I got um the, well, I'm gonna go, never mind. I think that's my next note. Okay, Hebrews 4 is the defin def definitive passage regarding Jesus as our Sabbath rest. So that whole uh, chapter, uh, chapter four, talks about uh, G Jesus being our Sabbath rest. The writers to the Hebrew exhorts his reader to enter in to the Sabbath rest provided by Christ. After three chapters of telling them that Jesus is superior to the angels and that he is our apostle and high priest, he pleads with them to not harden their hearts against him as their fathers hearten their hearts against the Lord in the wilderness. Because of their unbelief, God denied that generation access to the holy land, saying, they shall not enter into my rest, Hebrews 3, 11. In the same way, the writers to the Hebrew begs his readers not to make the same mistake by rejecting God's Sabbath rest in Jesus Christ. Um, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for anyone who enters God's rest also rest from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Hebrews 4, 9 through 11. Any questions? I think it does I do a little more explanation. There is no other Sabbath rest besides Jesus. He alone satisfies the requirement of the law, and he alone provides the sacrifice that atones for sin. He is God's plan for us to cease from the labors of our own work. We dare not reject this one and only way of salvation. John 14, 6. And I hope I'm explaining this right. Um, see, uh, the Old Testament uh, saints, well, the Old Testament uh, Jews, I'm sorry, they um, they had to work and, and do the sacrificing. Like I, I said, the sacrificing the goats, the the doves, the, I don't know what all, all the different things that they had, a sheep, they had to uh, use to um, atone for their sins. But here is saying that we don't have to do that. All we have to do is put our uh, trust in God for our salvation is to put our, uh, I'm sorry, a belief in Jesus Christ because he was our ultimate sacrifice when he died on the cross. We don't have to do all those things that the uh, people in the Old Testament did. So I, I, I'm just hoping that you guys understand. God's reaction to those who choose to reject his plan is seen in Numbers 15. And I, um, Numbers 15 was part of our um, daily Bible readings. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it talks about, and it, it's going to say here, it talks about this man. He uh, was disobedient. A man was found gathering sticks on the Sabbath day in spite of God's plain commandment to cease from all labor on the Sabbath. This transgression was a known and willful sin done with unblushing boldness in broad daylight in open defiance of the divine authority. Then the Lord said to Moses, the man must die. The whole assembly must stone him outside the camp. And that was in verse 35. So it will be to all who rejects God's provision for our Sabbath rest in Christ. 
How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So God back then in the Old Testament, they he killed those people that uh, that uh, were disobedient to him about the Sabbath. That man was just out picking up, um, I don't know, it didn't say why he was doing it, but he, he was picking up um, sticks or something. And, yes. and the Lord saw him. And he told Moses, that man must die. But, and he's also saying this to, our, to, to us, if we reject uh, Christ, which is our Sabbath rest, how can we escape? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So that same uh, consequence is going to happen to those who reject Christ. Any questions? <laughs> Am I right, Pastor Yvonne? Right. I had a little comment. Yeah, that's that's right. Uh, Go ahead. You can see how serious yes. um, the Sabbath is and how serious uh, God meant for it to be. Um, the guy, like you said, the guy was just gathering sticks. They are not, the Jewish people are not to do anything that is uh, considered work even to the smallest thing. and I have even, some list of things uh, coming up later. Even when we went to Israel on the weekend, beginning about noon, one o'clock in the afternoon, they started getting ready for the Sabbath, which starts at about four, five o'clock. And you can see the, the shopkeepers, everybody is closed down at about three o'clock it's like deserted. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's bumper to bumper people walking. That's how mm -hmm. quickly they close down everything. And mm -hmm. uh, the only thing they do, they have the uh, Sabbat meal uh, with each other, with the family. They sit down. They have uh, prayers. They do that. They have uh, tell stories of, you know, the Old Testament. In other words, they dedicate that time that 24 hour period back to things to of God, you know, right. with back no work. Mm -hmm. With no work. Now yeah. it's like you say it's a lot different. We live in a country where, you know, people work all around the clock and they're so glad to get a regular day off so they can do a little work around the house. And you know, if we keep the old testament, we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to uh just concentrate on the things of God, read scriptures you have family time, uh, maybe have, teach the children, you know, biblical stories and things like that. And um, that that's the way it's supposed to be. But very, very few people keep the Sabbath, you know, in our country and in, in free countries, you know. They, right. you know, they just look at it as a day off from work. But there's a there's a reason that God gives us. If God can work for six days and rest, he's showing us a pattern that we're supposed to do the same thing. Same thing. Okay. Okay, the phrase, did, I didn't read that, did I? No. The phrase, the Lord of the Sabbath, is found in Matthew 12, 8, Mark 2, 28, and Luke 6, 5. And in all three instances, Jesus is referring to himself as the Lord of the Sabbath, or as Mark records it, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Mark 2, 28, in these verses, Jesus is proclaiming that he is the one who exercises authority even over the rules and regulations that govern the Sabbath day. He is the one who exercises authority. So as such, Jesus was proclaiming to the world, especially to the legalistic Pharisees, that he was greater than the law and above the law of the most, uh, most uh, mosaic. mosaic covenant. Because as God in the flesh, he is the author of those laws. 
unable to keep the law, however, the Pharisees had instituted a complex and confusing system of Sabbath laws of their own that was oppressive and legalistic. They set up strict laws regarding how to observe the Sabbath, which included 39 categories of for forbidden activities. And my next page is going to show some of them because um, I couldn't write all of them down because they, they had, it's like seven or eight categories. And then under each category, there's um, maybe five, six, seven, ten. It, it does, um, but it, it totals 39. It, it'll come up total of 39. So in essence, these religious leaders had made themselves lords of the Sabbath, thus making themselves lords over the people. I'm going to go back to Mosaic Covenant. I had uh, written something written something down for that. The Mosaic Covenant is a conditional covenant made between God and the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai. And that was Exodus 19 through chapters 19 through 24. It is sometimes called the Sinai, Sinai Covenant but it is more often referred to as the Mosaic Covenant. Since Moses was God's chosen leader of Israel at that time, the Mosaic Covenant was centered around God's giving his divine law to Moses on Mount Sinai. And that's uh, when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. I didn't write everything down that that it because it was a lot of stuff. But that's basically what the Mosaic uh, covenant is. Okay, now this is uh, some of the things that uh, 39 forbidden activities that the Pharisees made up. It says the biblical ban against work on the Sabbath, while never clearly defined, includes activities such as baking, cooking, traveling, kindling fire, gathering wood, buying and selling, and burying burdens from one domain into another. The Talmudic rabbis listed 39 major categories of prohibited work, including agricultural activities, which is plowing and reaping, work entailed in the manufacture in the manufacture of cloth and that was spinning and weaving work entailed in preparing documents and that was any type of writing and then other forms of constructive work so like I say it's, it was a long list of the things that they could not do and the, the Pharisees made those um, things up I mean, they were oppressing the people and um, making up these laws for themselves because they wanted to be in charge. The law, yeah. The, they, the, they wanted to be in charge of the law. Can I say and, this, Sister Joyce? Sure. Uh, when we lived Jump in, in anytime. No, that's, when we lived in University City, uh -huh. um, uh, you know, that's uh, primarily a Jewish a area. Jewish nation, yes. And, I'm Jewish mm -hmm. territory. And um, so I remember this one time many, many years ago, um, we, you know, we knew most of the neighbors or, you know, at least holler at them, wave at them. Mm. So um, my husband happened to be, I think he had went around to somebody's house, but he passed this one lady's house who was a Jewish lady. And she called for him and asked if, if uh, he could do her a favor. And uh, yeah, he came up on the porch. She wa he she wanted him to turn on her lights. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I the lights you switch. saying that. Mm -hmm. the, You remember that the lights yes. in the uh, living room. Mm -hmm. Oh, she couldn't do that. Not only was it considered work, but it was also making a fire. Mm. 
when you know when you turn them on the switch you're conducting fire mm -hmm. uh, and so they couldn't do that and that's one thing that that's probably in the Talmud laws um you can't make a fire you can't strike a you know a fire so she had him because she had forgot to do it before the beginning of the Sabbat and so she had him do it yeah so, so in other words those um uh, the um what do you call those uh, type Jews, uh, Masonic Jews? Uh, no, they're just tra tra traditional, traditional Jews. Jews. They yeah. they still observe that um mm -hmm. that they, list that thirty nine um yeah they thirty nine they, they tried uh, but they forbidden. The whole thing is God was showing them that they couldn't keep all of the laws and all of the. Uh, all of those different things and they needed to come to Jesus you know mm -hmm. uh, even the um, all of the the different sundry laws that listed in Leviticus and all of that they couldn't keep all of those laws and, and that was one of the reasons you know God allowed those laws to be instituted just to show them that they couldn't keep them couldn't all do it. they needed Jesus yes as creator, Christ was the original Lord of the Sabbath, John 1, 3, and Hebrews 1, 10. He had the authority to overrule the Pharisees' traditions and regulations because he had created the Sabbath. And the creator is always greater than the creation. Furthermore, Jesus claimed the authority to correctly interpret the meaning of the Sabbath and all the laws pertaining to it because Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He is free to do on it and with it whatever he pleases. Mm -hmm. I think this might be my last. Oh no, one more. As Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus had the right the power and the authority to dispense it in any way he pleased. The Lord of the Sabbath had come and with his death and resurrection, he became the fulfillment of our Sabbath rest. The salvation we have in Christ has made the old law of the Sabbath no longer needed or binding. When Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath in Mark 2, 27. Jesus was attesting to the fact that just as the Sabbath day was originally instituted to give man rest from his labors, so did he come to provide us rest from laboring to achieve our own salvation by our works. Because of his sacrifice on the cross, we can now forever cease laboring to attain God's favor and rest in his mercy and grace. And I think that's my last thing. Yep. So any questions or did you guys understand that? I, I You know what? I really, really... Uh, it helped me. I don't know if it helped you, but it helped me to really, really understand how Jesus is our Sabbath rest. What he did on the cross, we don't have to do those things like the, the Old Testament uh, um, Jews did. So, and, and all we have to do is accept him. Salvation, accept our salvation in him. And we can rest in him because he did it all. We don't mm -hmm. have to do anything as far as uh, working to, um, you know, as, as long as we accept Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, God is pleased with us. See, those Old Testament uh, Jews, they were trying to do all these things to please God. And they couldn't do them all. They had to continually do it. Uh, uh, every time they sinned, they had to keep doing different things uh, as far as um, um, the sacrifices that they had to make. But all we do is we accept Christ uh, as our personal Lord and Savior. And when we do make a mistake, we have him to go to and ask him uh, to forgive us. We don't have to uh, take a 
a, a lamb or goat or whatever to uh, sacrifice for the sin that we did. We just ask uh, the Lord to forgive us for our sins. And we're resting from all those labors that the people, uh, they're still doing them. Pastor Yvonne said the, the, the Jews, because they don't believe in Jesus. Well, those, they don't do as many of the, that's why, <laughs> you know. I, don't, I mean, they don't sacrifice the goats yeah, and all that. The, yeah, uh, for health reasons, they don't do the sacrificial uh, killing of animals in the temples over there in Israel or even here in America mm -hmm. anymore. Uh, so they don't do that part, which means the Bible says if you don't keep one part of the law, <laughs> you don't, you don't, you miss all of it. So right, right there, should tell them that you know this ain't working. But anyway, right. uh, I just wanted to say that if we keep in mind that the Old Testament was physical uh -huh. things you had to do, uh -huh. the New Testament is spiritual. Uh -huh. okay uh -huh. uh, the old testament had a bunch of laws and a bunch of rules and regulations that you had to keep and and the jewish people they're not the only um religion that has a bunch of of uh laws that they have to keep uh i was thinking about the you know like catholicism uh, so yes. they have a lot of things that they have to do uh to help them to to realize that they are saved or uh they are okay with god they have to do so many hail marys they have to pray the rosary so many times a day they have to uh go to confession uh ever so often so there's things they have to do mm -hmm. physical things they have to do so they put themselves in bondage when yes. Jesus has given his life so we don't have to do have that. to do those things okay good any any more questions or comments because I have a video another video oh I have I think two or three little videos it's very important that you guys understand that what yeah. sister, what sister Joyce taught us today it's very, very important. That's, you know, that's just part of um, the training that we should have as Christians to know and to understand um, about, you know, our Sabbath rest, our rest in Christ, and uh, the things that we we don't have to do anymore, and don't let people put you in bondage, saying that you do. So there's people out there that say that you, that's why writing down scriptures and getting familiar with scriptures uh, and things like that will help you uh, when you come across people who uh, still try to keep the Sabbath, uh, still try to keep the, the laws, even the Messianic Jews, uh -huh. the Jews that have accepted Jesus Christ, they still you know, I, I think it's more tradition, but they still, uh, you know, keep the, observe some of those things. Mm -hmm, they still observe some of the things. And I, I'm, I'm thinking it's more tradition because they just they were just brought up that way. And, mm. you know, it's, you know, custom, more customs than anything else. But, uh, yeah, they they still do a lot of that stuff. Uh, I, what about the the seven day of Venice? They um, they. Um, worship the Sabbath the same mm -hmm. way from Friday to Saturday and they try to condemn people and I, I when I looked that up it says you're not to um, um, not condemn I don't know the word I should use but you shan't you shouldn't um, try to tell people that they have to serve you know um, celebrate uh, Friday to Saturday you you don't have to do you're not supposed to do that but um I know the seven day of Venice they kind of talk about you it's, it's well, saying that we don't they, celebrate the Sabbath like um because we don't celebrate the Sabbath like they do they like say well you're not celebrating the Sabbath the Sabbath is Friday to Saturday or whatever you know not only do they 
condemn people who don't, they tell mm -hmm. them that they're not saved. Right. That's the bad part. Yes. And, and they you say you share, should Right. You can share your faith or whatever and even invite, you know, we celebrate, you know, we take our Sabbath day on on us uh Friday to Saturday. And, you know, if you you know, just tell people that's what you do and they decide to do it too, fine. But if they don't, you can't tell them they're not saved. Right. That's when it becomes wrong. Yes. That's when it becomes a cult. Yes. That's that's what I read. And, and that's why Seven Day Adventist is a cult. Yes. Because when you start putting stipulations that the Bible doesn't put on on us, but you put them on people and tell them that, you know, they're not saying they're going to hell or whatever. Well, they got so many things messed up in, in Seven Day Adventist. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, uh, that's one of the things that they that they do. There's a lady that worked with us, one of the little outreaches, sandwich day we had down here, uh, Marie, sweet little lady. And uh, uh, I think somebody from when I was at Walgreens uh, told me about her. She liked to do outreach and she wanted to uh, uh, help us. And so I called her when we had sandwich outreach. I said, you can come around and help. I, did, I found out she was Seventh-day Adventist. And uh, so she had a good time that day and uh, everything. So what was it we did, oh, when we had the clothes outreach on a Saturday, we had the food thing on a Thursday. So that was okay. Uh -huh. Had our uh, clothing giveaway on a Saturday. And I called Maria, said, you want to come around and help? She said, oh, no, that's the, that's the Lord's Sabbath. She said, I can't, you know, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. and um so they are uh very and, and that scripture came back to me what you use today that you know uh, something as important as serving other people or mm -hmm. saving people or uh if your animal is trapped you know or mm -hmm. get in trouble you know, go get that animal. Um, uh, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Right. But some people are so so staunch on and on that they will not do anything. anything. In other words, if there's an emergency on the Sabbath, on the day that you choose to rest, if there's an emergency, break it to go take care of the emergency. Or to do a good work or to mm -hmm. do a good deed if you have the opportunity. Yes. So, you know, but they won't. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. This little video uh, is about preparing yourself. So. Soon out of stock. I know we've seen this. Empty shelves. <laughs> I don't, uh, I know uh, I have, and I know my son, I sent him a couple of times ago get something. He said, Mama, they don't even have, I mean, some simple like eggs mm -hmm. and um, some, several things I've sent him to the store for. And he said, they said they don't have, they, they're out of stock. So, just be looking for this. This is soon out of stock, and it tells you um, what to kind of stock start stocking up on. Are you prepared for the impending storm of skyrocketing prices in grocery products next month? Folks, as we speak, the global supply chain is teetering on the edge. And next month, we're facing a crisis unlike any we've seen before. I don't mean to alarm you. But the time for action is now. The prices of essential grocery products are about to soar to unprecedented levels, leaving many American families struggling to put food on the table. So what are these 10 grocery products that will skyrocket in price next month? Let's delve into the heart of the matter. First on the list, eggs. Folks, listen up, because this is important. We're seeing egg prices hitting the roof again, and it's not just a small bump. We're talking a real uptick here. And if you're not paying attention, it's going to hit your wallet hard. But don't worry, I've got some tips and a bit of insight on why this is happening and how you can prepare. 
First off, you've probably noticed it's getting tougher to find good deals on eggs, right? But keep your eyes peeled for promotions at places like Meyer. They've been running some specials that can help cut down on costs, even if it's just by a little. Every cent counts in times like these. Now let's dive into why this is all happening. After a period of relief, egg prices are on the rise again in 2024, and it looks like this trend might stick around for a bit. We're dealing with another nasty outbreak of bird flu, folks. This isn't just any flu. It's a highly contagious and deadly strain called H5N1. It's been wreaking havoc since early 2022, leading to the largest bird flu outbreak in U.S. history. This has slashed the egg supply while demand stayed steady, pushing prices up. In January, the average cost for a dozen grade A large eggs was $2.52, which is a slight increase from December's $2.51, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. While that might not seem like a lot, every little increase adds up, especially when you consider the consumer price index showing a 3.4% price jump from December to January. Even though these prices aren't as high as the peak we saw in January 2023, when a dozen eggs hit $4.82, they're still not back to the pre-pandemic normal. And with the latest outbreak claiming 13.64 million egg-laying hens, prices are expected to keep climbing. So what's a smart person to do? Stockpile, but do it wisely. Given the volatility, I'd suggest keeping a three to six month supply of eggs if you have the means to store them properly. Consider investing in a good refrigerator or a freeze drying machine to preserve them longer. This isn't about hoarding, it's about being prepared. With over 81.9 million birds affected by the virus since January 2022, the shortage could worsen before it gets better. Two, butter. Oh man, let me tell you, the way things are going, it's no surprise to see butter prices hitting the roof at Aldi, jumping up to $3.69 for a four-stick pack. Remember when we could snag it for just $2.49? Those were the days, huh? But here's the deal. With the way the economy's been under the current administration, it's like every time you blink, prices on everything are shooting up. It's not just butter, it's across the board. That's why, as someone who believes in being prepared, I've been saying it's crucial to stockpile and be ready for whatever comes next. Given the current state of things with prices skyrocketing and uncertainty about what's next, it's wise to have a clear plan. For butter, if you're using about a pack a week for cooking, baking, and the like, you're looking at needing roughly four packs a month. Given the price hikes and the potential for even more inflation, aiming to have a six-month supply would mean stockpiling around 24 packs. Now, if you've got the freezer space, that's a solid buffer against price increases and shortages. Plus, butter freezes well, so you're not sacrificing quality for quantity. But why stop at stockpiling? If you're really into ensuring you're prepared and cutting costs, consider making your own butter. It's simpler than you might think. All you need is heavy cream and a bit of salt. And with some shaking or mixing, you've got yourself homemade butter. This can be a fun, cost-effective way to build your stockpile. Plus, making your own means you know exactly what's going into it. No added preservatives or chemicals. Three, have you noticed the crazy jump in meat prices lately? I mean, we're talking beef, chicken, and especially pork. It's like every time I head to the store for some good old BBQ supplies, the prices are through the roof. We used to snag those pork ribs and cuts for a steal, around $2.99, $3.49 a pound, right? Now it's like they've hit the jackpot, soaring to $5.99, $6.99 a pound. It's nuts. Now I'm not just here to rant. I've been doing some thinking and a bit of preparing too. With prices skyrocketing the way they are, it's clear this isn't just a blip on the radar. It's looking like this could be the new standard. And that's got me thinking about stockpiling. Not in a panic buying kind of way, but smart and strategic, you know? So here's the deal. If you're like me and enjoy those weekend BBQs with the family, it's time to get ahead of these price hikes. I'm talking about buying in bulk and preserving. With pork prices taking the lead in this crazy dance, it's a good idea to focus there. But don't forget about beef and chicken either. Variety is the spice of life after all. How much to stockpile, you ask? Well, it depends on your storage capabilities and your family's consumption. A good rule of thumb is to aim for a three to six month supply. Why? Because it gives you a buffer. If prices keep climbing, you've got your stash. And if they drop, you've saved yourself some serious cash by buying at today's prices. Now, preserving meat is key. 
Freezing is the most straightforward method. If you've got a vacuum sealer, even better. It'll keep that meat fresh for longer by preventing freezer burn. And if you're really into maximizing your prep, consider learning how to cure and smoke meats. Not only does it add incredible flavor, but it also extends the shelf life of your stockpile. Four, dairy. Yeah, you heard me right. Milk, cheese, butter, the whole shebang. It's not just a little bump in price we're seeing, it's more like a leap. Here in Cincinnati, Ohio, milk prices alone have shot up by 60, 70 cents across the board. And it's not just us feeling it, this is a nationwide trend. Cheese has been holding steady for now, but in these times, who knows how long that'll last, right? So why am I bringing this up? Because my friend, in times like these, being prepared is not just smart, it's essential. Think about it. Prices going up means every trip to the grocery store is going to hit your wallet harder. And it's not just dairy. It's a sign of the times. But let's focus on dairy for a moment. Why stockpile, you ask? Well, aside from avoiding the pinch of rising prices, there's the matter of availability. Ever walked into a store and found the shelves a little too bare for comfort? Yeah, me too. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather have a stash at home than take my chances on what's left at the store. Number five on the list of foods that will skyrocket in price next month, fish and seafood. If you're anything like me, a good piece of salmon or a handful of shrimp can really make a meal special. But I've got some news that might have us both rethinking our next seafood feast. Post Easter, we're staring down the barrel of some serious price spikes in the fish and seafood department. It's not just a small bump either. We're talking about a trend that's set to continue from last year. Shortages are hitting the industry hard and when supply can't meet demand, well, you know the drill prices go up. Number six, this is something that hits close to home for a lot of us, the humble sandwich. It's a staple, right? Quick to make, satisfying, and the options are endless. But my friend, we've got a bit of a situation brewing in the deli aisle that's making our beloved sandwich a bit less accessible for everyone. We're seeing brands like Boar's Head, you know, Ooh. the ones we reach for when we want to treat ourselves to something a bit nicer than the standard fare. Well, their prices are on the rise, and not just a little bump. We're talking about hitting the range of $13.49 to $14.99 a pound for essentials like ham and roast beef. For a lot of us, that's a tough pill to swallow. Sandwiches are supposed to be easy, affordable options, not something that makes us wince when we see the checkout total. So, what's a sandwich lover to do in times like these? First off, don't panic. We've navigated through dairy and seafood spikes, and we'll get through this one too. It's all about being smart and maybe a bit creative. One approach is to start thinking about alternatives. Turkey and chicken are often less expensive than beef and ham, and they can be just as satisfying. Or consider this an opportunity to explore beyond the meat section. Have you tried making a sandwich with a hearty grilled portobello mushroom or maybe some high quality cheese and a spread of pesto. Delicious and often more wallet friendly. But if you're set on sticking with your deli favorites, then it's time to think about bulk buying and storage. Some stores offer discounts when you buy larger quantities. You can purchase a few pounds at a lower price per pound, then portion it out and freeze what you won't use right away. Just make sure to wrap it well to prevent freezer burn. Number seven. Folks, I gotta tell you, what's happening with the price of a simple McDonald's hash brown is just the tip of the iceberg. Imagine, shelling out over $1.03 for something that used to be pocket change. That's right, over three bucks for a hash brown. And it's not just about the hash browns, is it? We're talking about the whole menu. This isn't just a McDonald's problem, it's a glaring sign of how out of touch corporate America is getting. Thinking they can keep jacking up prices without us batting an eye. But here's the deal people are waking up. They're not just grumbling under their breath anymore, they're pushing back. And finally, it seems like McDonald's is starting to get the message. The bigwigs, the ones cozy in their executive offices, are admitting that maybe, just maybe, they've pushed the envelope a bit too far. They're seeing sales dip, especially among the folks who can't just throw around cash like it's nothing. We're talking about the backbone of America here, the hardworking folks making around $45,000 or less. Even McDonald's is noticing they're losing grip on this crucial group. So what's the big response? A promise to cut prices on some items. Finally, some recognition that not everyone can keep up with these skyrocketing costs. But let's not get too excited yet. There's been no word on when or how much they'll cut prices. It's a step, but is it enough? And let's talk about the real kicker here. Dining out has become a luxury. With prices at restaurants shooting up by over 5% last year, 
while grocery prices inch up at a much slower pace, it's no wonder folks are opting to eat at home. It's just more bang for your buck. If you're a fan of hash browns, I have a very simple recipe for you. Making hash browns at home is not only fun, but it's also an excellent way to save money while still enjoying that crispy, golden deliciousness. Allow me to guide you through an easy recipe that will enable you to prepare your own batch of hash browns quickly. The best part? You can control the ingredients, making it a healthier option as well. First things first, you'll need a couple of medium-sized potatoes. Now, here's a little trick. To get that perfect texture, you'll want to grate those potatoes. But before you do, give them a good wash. No need to peel them unless you're really not a fan of the skin. The skin actually adds a nice texture and a bunch of nutrients. Once you've got your potatoes grated, the key is to get as much moisture out of them as possible. Moisture is the enemy of crispiness. Just wrap those grated potatoes in a clean kitchen towel and give them a good squeeze. You'll be surprised at how much water comes out. Now heat up a skillet on medium-high heat. Add a good dollop of butter or oil, whatever you prefer. Spread those grated, squeezed dry potatoes evenly in the skillet. Here's where you can get creative. Want to spice things up? Toss in some salt, pepper, maybe even a little garlic powder or paprika for that extra kick. Let it cook without disturbing for a few minutes. You're looking for that golden brown crust to form on the bottom. Once it's crisped up nicely, give it a flip. Easier said than done, right? But don't sweat it. If it breaks apart, just patch it back together. It'll still taste amazing. <laughs> After both sides are beautifully golden and crispy, you're done. Serve it hot, maybe with a side of eggs or however you like your breakfast. See, making hash browns at home is a piece of cake, or should I say a piece of potato? Plus, experimenting with different flavors and toppings is half the fun. Give it a go, and you might find you prefer your homemade version over anything you can buy. Plus, your wallet will thank you too. Number eight, the price of rice is skyrocketing. Now, this isn't just about us having to tighten our belts a bit more at the checkout. This is a glimpse into a much larger picture that affects not just our wallets, but our way of life. Let's talk about what's happening over in Thailand first. Arnong Mongoe, a rice farmer in Konkane province, has been in the game for half a century. That's dedication. Despite the sweat and toil, the return on that hard work isn't what it used to be. Especially since 2022, when global tensions shook the markets like a thunderstorm. And here's the kicker. While we're seeing prices skyrocket, farmers like Arnong are making peanuts. The mills aren't paying more, and these farmers have no choice but to sell at whatever price they're offered. They've got bills to pay, trucks that cost money to hire. It's a tough spot. Now, while other crops like wheat and corn saw a price drop in 2023, rice stubbornly stayed high. Why? Mother Nature threw us a curveball with a persistent La Nina, followed by an El Nino. Then India, a major player in the rice game, put restrictions on non-Basmati rice exports fearing a shortfall in production. This move alone pulled a staggering 9 million metric tons off the global market, sending prices soaring. Imagine that. India accounts for 40% of the global rice supply. That's no small change. Countries heavily reliant on India for their rice are feeling the pinch. We're talking about places like the Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, and several countries in West Africa. These aren't just statistics, these are millions of people whose daily lives are impacted. What's really concerning is the forecast that rice prices will remain high into 2024. This isn't just a blip on the radar, it's a sustained issue that could lead to increased food insecurity for billions of people, especially in Asia and Africa. In Nigeria, for example, rice prices jumped 61% in just a few months. The Philippines had to impose a price cap, for heaven's sake, because things got so bad. Number nine, peanut butter. Fellow Americans, I've got to tell you, it's not just your imagination that your grocery bill seems a bit steeper these days. You've probably noticed it too, especially if you're a fan of that all-American classic, the PB&J sandwich. Well, it's time to brace ourselves for a bit more of a hit to our wallets because peanut butter prices have been on the rise, ticking up by 2.6% from November to December. And if we look at the big picture, that's an increase of 3% from the previous year. Now I know what you're thinking, it's just peanut butter. But hear me out. For folks like us who appreciate the value of every dollar and the importance of being prepared, these changes are more than just numbers. Given its nutritious value, long shelf life, and recent price hikes, it makes sense to have a good supply on hand. For a single individual, 
I'd recommend having at least a six month supply of peanut butter. This means if you consume a jar of peanut butter every two weeks, you should aim to have around 12 jars in your stockpile. This quantity ensures that you have enough to maintain a steady diet without frequent trips to the store, which can save money in the long run, especially if prices continue to rise. For a family of four, consumption rates might be higher, depending on everyone's dietary habits. Let's say your family goes through a jar per week. In this case, a six-month supply would amount to about 24 jars. It might sound like a lot, but remember, peanut butter is incredibly versatile and can be used in a variety of meals beyond just sandwiches, like smoothies, sauces, and even some baking recipes. When stockpiling, it's also essential to consider the storage conditions. Peanut butter should be kept in a cool, dry place to maintain its quality and shelf life. And while unopened jars can last beyond their best buy date, it's smart to rotate your stock to ensure you're always using the freshest jars first. Number 10, sugars and sweets. This year, the prices are going through the roof, and I mean sky high, folks. We're talking a jaw-dropping 92.75% increase compared to what we were paying back in 2019. Can you believe that? It's like everything we enjoy is getting more and more out of reach. And then, now let's break it down and see what's really going on with our favorite sugary treats. First off, chocolate. Who doesn't love a good piece of chocolate, right? Well, brace yourselves. Companies like Mondelez, you know, the big guns behind Cadbury, Oreos, Toblerone, they're all saying prices are gonna go up. It's all down to the cost of sugar and cocoa. They're not playing around. It's a straight up price hike hitting us consumers. And it's not just chocolate, folks. Cookies, candy, all that good stuff is getting pricier. The global cost of sugar is at its highest since 2011, thanks to things like India's dry spell and Thailand's drought messing with production. And guess who's footing the bill? That's right, us. Prices for these sweets rose by 8.9% in 2023 and we're looking at another 5.6% increase this year. It's like they're trying to squeeze every penny out of us. Now, on to desserts and confectionery. It's the same sad song, different verse. Climate change is throwing a wrench in food production, including sugar. Extreme weather is messing with yields, and our desserts are on the line. So next time you're craving something sweet, you might just find the price has gone up again. The big picture, it's a mess. Sugar production is down thanks to export limits and all sorts of bottlenecks at the ports. It's not just one or two sweets, it's the whole shebang seeing price hikes. Thank you for watching. Okay, what do y'all think about that? <laughs> so true. Ooh, that was very informative. <laughs> yes, yes. So he's just telling us to get ready. And I truly believe that I already seen uh, eggs out here. Um, um, when I sent Wayne to get some eggs, he said, Mama, them eggs cost $2.78 for 12. Yes, ma'am. They, they, they high. They're high. Mm -hmm. So just. Snooks had one, some for $2.38. Who? Snooks had some. Snooks, a, a dozen yeah, for you, $2. You're going to you're gonna have to look around. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all these used to be the cheapest, but now all these them went up. Mm -hmm. Aldi's is trying to get their money too. Mm -hmm. Aldi's is not cheap anymore. No. It's not cheap anymore. Well, sure it isn't. I don't buy meat out of Aldi's at all because mm -hmm. they went up on the price of meat. Yes. Excuse mm -hmm. me. Okay. Is that um, uh, su supply chain and and as far yeah. as the form and uh, uh, items like our uh, flour and wheat. And uh, rice and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We've sold a lot or most of our farms to China. Yes, you know what? I so, just I was just I saw that. We don't uh, very few. There's very few American farms now. I mean, they're there, but Americans don't own them. Right, and you know who else owns them too, Pastor Yvonne? What's the uh, what does I, that mean? The, the the richest the rich man Sarah? not uh mu mu mux mus the other yeah. one so, uh, Be uh, Beso, uh is it what is it Be Beso or uh uh um, the richest oh, guy yeah, yeah. Who? Sorry, George, not, sorry. No, it's not him. It's Are on the tip of my Bill tongue. Gates. Bill Gates. Bill Gates. Bill, Bill Gates. Gates. They yeah. say he he has bought he hasn't bought any right? in Missouri. 
but they were showing all the land that he has bought from farmers. They're trying to get us to be plant-based mm -hmm. and they're taking all the farms. Uh, and so the farmers won't produce the meat that uh, mm -hmm. we need. But anyway, that, that's another subject. <laughs> Well, I mean, oh. it's the same thing we have to, and he was absolutely right. That's one of the things uh, Pastor Sam can eat because <clears throat> he's, Pastor Sam is on a, like a year long, year long um, fast. <clears throat> so he started January 1st. So it's very mm. few things that he eat. Mm. And um, so one of the things that he can eat is, is peanut butter and I, I we probably got about 20 jars of peanut butter really and i don't eat peanut butter so it's it's mm -hmm. all his he um he's very careful about not buying anything that is made in china so everything that uh he normally does most of the shopping and everything that uh he buys he checks the label including vitamins mm -hmm. to see where uh, because their standards are so low, uh, the cleanliness yeah. in their factories and things like that. Plus, they have that slave labor, and uh, which you know, which we don't like. You know, just using those people. So we what? try to avoid things made in China. You know, with, like a plague. You know, and um, right. Well, yeah. Sharina, Sharina can tell you about that cleanliness. <laughs> Yeah, they, she said they was the nastiest people. They don't have standards, and and they somebody said that they do have people from here going over there to check, you know, stuff that you know they make for us. But um, mm -hmm. they, they can't control, you know, their their factories and in their labs and places like that, you know, uh, yeah. the way that they should if they were in this country. But um, nobody wants to work for the amount of money that most industries can pay. So everybody is using China to make their stuff <clears throat> so they can get that slave labor. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, which says a lot about our ethics, you know, here. Yes. Yes. It's, it's, it's a oh. mess. <laughs> it's a mess. Yes. Well, I thought I'd just kind of inform you about... Uh, things that's going out. I mean, that um, we need to kind of stock up on. You know, we can do it slowly yeah, at a time, but uh, he's saying that the price, and I believe the prices are going up. I know we can we can attest to that. Prices are going up. Okay, guys, I have two more little videos. One is um, uh, musical, and then I'll we'll do the prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Hey. Blessed assurance, yeah. Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of his spirit. And washed in his blood And what he did for me on Calvary Is more than enough So I trust in God My Savior, the one Who will never fail
perfect submission and all is at rest I know the offer of tomorrow has ordered my steps so this is my story and this is my song my song I'm praising my risen King and Savior all the day song since I've been playing it. Um, um, uh, this um, prayer 
I have a one prayer I'm going to uh, play, and it's for healing. And our today focus was supposed to have been on healing. And I'm going to play this one prayer, and then I'll do a closing prayer after this uh, prayer. And this prayer is about healing. Okay? Yes. Get this come on. Welcome to the prayer for healing sickness. This is simply a video I've put together where I'd like to pray for anyone within the sound of my voice. All I ask you to do is to agree with me as we seek our Heavenly Father together. Please continue to meditate on this prayer for yourself. Speak it daily or listen to this video over and over again. And allow the Word of God concerning healing sickness to reach deep into your spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather together here online and come into agreement in the wonderful and powerful name of Jesus. Where two or more are gathered, there you shall surely be, and anything we agree upon is touching, you will surely do. The Bible says that if there's any unforgiveness, that it should be dealt with before praying. Therefore, we release any anger, bad feelings, resentment, or any other wrong attitude before you now. We lay it at your feet, and we release and forgive those who have wronged us. I lift up those watching this video, and we come into agreement and lift up healing uh, any and all sickness in their bodies. Lord, thank you for sending your word to heal those listening now and delivering them from all their destructions. Jesus paid it all for them. Jesus is the word who became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus bore their pains and carried their sickness. He was pierced through for their transgressions and crushed for their iniquities. The chastisement of their well-being was upon them, and by his stripes they were healed. The book of James says that the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. And if they've committed sins, they will be forgiven. And right now, those listening let go of all unforgiveness, resentment, anger, and bad feelings towards anyone. Therefore, Father, as we agree online, we give attention to your words and incline our ear to your sayings. We will not let them depart from our sight, but we will keep them in the midst of our hearts, for they are life and health to our whole body. The body of those listening is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and together we desire and agree that it is in good health. We seek truth that will make the listener free. We ask you to help them with their eating habits and, and that they get appropriate rest and exercise. Those listening were bought at a price by you, and they desire to, to glorify you in their spirit and their body, their entire being, since everything belongs to you. Father, since the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in them, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to their mortal body through the spirit who dwells in them. We bind every abnormality and sickness that's trying to make a home in the body of those listening. We break the power of the enemy right now in Jesus' name and command any ailment, sickness, or anything that should not be there to leave the listener's body now in Jesus' name. We declare total healing and health over those listening to this prayer. We declare every cell in their body, every system, every organ, every function, from the top of their head to the soles of their feet, get in alignment to health and wholeness in Jesus' name. We speak peace and restoration over their body and even their mind, will, and emotions. We declare mental clarity right now and that the listener be strengthened to enable them to cast down the lies of the devil and those self-sabotaging thoughts. We declare that they will think on your word, Father, and meditate on who they are in Jesus. We bind your peace around the listener's soul now in Jesus' name. We come boldly to your throne of grace and present those listening before you for deliverance. I stand in the gap and I'm praying now, knowing that the Holy Spirit within me takes hold together with those listening against the evils that would attempt to hold them in bondage. We break the power of the enemy right now in their life. In the name of Jesus, we declare that the traps and the plans of the enemy are exposed, useless, and void, and come to nothing. Lord, help those listening to hold up their shield of faith and quench every fiery dart of the adversary that would come against them. In agreement that we ask that your plans and your calling for the listener would come to pass, we bind their entire being, spirit, soul, and body to what you desire for their life. We declare that they are willing and obedient to follow you, as surely you will lead them safely. The mind of Christ is theirs, and we bind their thoughts, feelings, and the intent of their heart to you. Every negative and godly attitude, addiction, idea, desire, habit, behavior, and belief, we lift up to you. And we loose it from binding them any longer in Jesus' name. We loose any negative strongholds in their life and break the power of them in the listener's life in Jesus' name. We declare the angels of God who are ministering spirits go forth and protect and supply those listening with everything they have need of to walk in victory. Together in unity, we decree in Jesus' name that the devil shall not get an advantage over the listener. We ask that the listener be strengthened not by power nor by might, but by your spirit so that they can submit to you and resist the devil. We plead the blood of Jesus over the listener and their friends and family. The devil and his whole entourage are overcome by the blood and your word and must bow their knees. We thank you that the power of the enemy is no match, absolutely no match for the one who lives inside those listening to and agreeing with his prayer. 
Yes, the listener is delivered from this present evil world. They are delivered from the powers of darkness. Father, let your love fill every aspect of the life of those listening. Where your love is, there is no fear. Help them to recognize that. Let your peace and protection fill them up and surround them everywhere they go by land, water, or air. We ask that you fill those listening with your love, your peace, your spirit, your wisdom, your revelation, and understanding in the name of Jesus. Fresh and new, God. Let it bubble up and over again and help them to recognize it. Thank you, Lord, that the listener is redeemed out of the hand of, of Satan by the blood of Jesus. They are justified and made righteous by the blood of Jesus and belong to you. The listener has escaped the snare of the devil who has held them captive. The listener does your will. They will glorify you in their spirit, their soul, their body. Thank you, Father, that Jesus was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The devil's works are destroyed in the listener's life in the name of Jesus. The listener walks in the kingdom of God, which is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Thank you that those listening will prosper and be in health even as their soul prospers. We believe we receive healing for all sickness. And thank you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Okay, let me finish. Father, I, I come to add my prayers to uh, Daniel's prayer, and I just thank you, and I praise you for each and every one, Father God, that came out this morning to learn more and more about you. We thank you, Lord, that we we know that you are our Sabbath rest, and we thank you, Lord, for what you did for us on the cross, and we give you all praise, honor, and glory. I thank you again for each family that's represented here, and I pray, Father God, that everyone is healed from the top of their head to the soles of their feet with your healing power in Jesus' name, and uh, uh, I give you all praise honor and glory and until we meet again tomorrow on sunday uh, i say amen and i pray this in jesus name amen amen amen, amen. <laughs> very good very good amen stop sharing okay yeah. you guys enjoyed that yes yes, yes. Ma wonderful beautiful <laughs>